So what you're saying is I can't call it Z7. Chris, Nikon has insisted that this model is called the Z worldwide. But what about Canadians? What about the British? Chris, Z. Say it. Z. I'm still gonna say Z. Thank you very much. Thank you. Z. Yes. Welcome back, Deep Your View TV viewers. Chris Nichols here from Deep Your View, and today we're actually coming from DP Review. It's awesome. We're actually here in Seattle at the offices. And that's because we have a very exciting sneak peek. This is the brand new Nikon Mirrorless Z7. Now, of course, you gotta remember this is very early sneak peek. So this is a pre-production camera. This is not a review, but it does give us an opportunity to look at things like ergonomics, handling, menu systems, and where this camera is gonna go when it hits final launch. The other cool thing is we're gonna incorporate a lot of the DP Review staff because as you can see there, they're grabbing their sandwiches while being on the phone, very productive members of society. And uh, what we're gonna do is do some tests with them. We're gonna see how they do the product shots, see how they do a lot of their testing, see how we do a lot of the, the hands-on kind of applications. We're even gonna get in the field with this camera. It's gonna be very exciting. Stay tuned. Okay, so Dan, while we're shooting these photos, we've just seen the camera the first time. What's your sort of impression of the looks of the camera, the aesthetics? I'm really uh, impressed and just having held it for a little bit of time, it really, it, ha it feels like a Nikon. It's got that really yeah. good grip. Um, a lot of the controls are placed where I would expect them to be for a Nikon again. But it really does look like a mini SLR in the aesthetics. I mean, do you, do you think that's a positive move? Do you think they should have gone to like a more radical new mirrorless design or a retro design? Sure. I, no, I, you know, I think it hits, it hits it just perfectly. It's not too foreign to DSLR shooters that they're going to be shying away from it. You know, it's still a working tool. It's supposed to be for photographers to use and not just lust over. I'm really excited to get out there and shoot with it. Um, and unfortunately, just shooting product shots is the first step yeah. before you get to have <laughs> That's all you get it. to do. And Dan, this is typically how you do this? This is a pretty normal, typical product shot. That's the, yeah, this is the, this is the, this is the method. The skateboard's pretty integral. Yeah, it's oh, really nice. There we go. We got a great location to test this camera out in May. And uh, let's talk about the viewfinder because I think somebody coming from an SLR, that's such an important part of the interface, right? How do we give it that optical viewfinder to go to an electric viewfinder? So you've been shooting with a while, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I'm actually, I'm surprised. It's actually really easy, it's almost seamless. The precision in there, the clarity of the image that I'm seeing on the viewfinder is phenomenal. Do you think that's gonna be something that people will find them very easy to transition from themselves? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think they're even going to notice, actually, if you shoot from a DSLR. Very cool. If you pick this up, it'll be just, it'll feel the same. So maybe people might be wondering why we're hiding the camera and it up here and showing people. It's because we're in public. We're not supposed to let people see it, right? We're trying to be as right. incognito as possible. But having great EVF is great, but the touchscreen also seems to be well implemented. Hey, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. It's, you can pretty much get anything you want from the touchscreen. You can access all the menu items that you'd normally be accessing while you're shooting. I mean, this is nothing new. Like other companies have done this well, but it's nice to see Nikon's not leaving any of that on the table, which exactly. is good. Exactly. And it's, I mean, it's an interface people are used to. You know, exactly. if they're coming from their cell phones, if they're coming from other cameras that have the touch interface. My only complaint again, and I, I guess I keep harping on this with Nikon, the 5500, the 5600, you could bring the camera to your eye and you could use your thumb on the yes. screen to change autofocus. Here we can't do that. Right. We do have the joystick selector on the back, but I think that would speed things up and make it a bit more intuitive, right? Especially because if you go between shooting using the screen and then bringing it up to use the EVF, you want to just keep you know, choosing your focal points in the same way. And keep it's just flow. natural to just yeah. keep you know, using the screen to find it. And so to have to move to one of the more traditional ways of finding your focus, it's a little clunky. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah? Oh, it's eight pounds. Yeah, like it's just over 600 grams uh, with a battery in it. 
quite light, you know, like 30% lighter than a DD50, 40% lighter. So on the grip, the positives, I think you get a really solid purchase even with heavier lenses, but one negative, for the life of me, I cannot touch the function one and function two buttons right next to the lens mount unless I let the grip go and jam the fingers in. It's honestly not very comfortable. And I know I don't have the longest fingers. I think anybody else might be okay, but yeah, if you've got smaller hands, that's a little tricky to use. So Richard, can you explain to us what you're actually doing here? Yeah, basically what I'm doing is scrolling through the menus, um, trying to look for any of the customization options um, and make, sh make sure that I've recorded them um, so we can compare them to the options in the D850 so we can get an impression of the uh, what the customization options are going to be even after the camera's gone back to Nikon. Right. And as you're going through, I know you're still sort of midway, but uh, any impressions on the menu system? Very familiar to a classic Nikon? It will be absolutely familiar to yeah. an existing user. Um, the options are pretty much the same and arranged in the same order. Um, the logic and occasionally lack of it is entirely consistent. Really, Chris, you're, gonna, you're really gonna make me wear the lab coat? Yeah, Rishi, I mean, when you're in the lab, you wear the lab coat, and that's how it works. <sighs> All right, man, just for you. I appreciate it. But like, how come Dan's not wearing a lab coat? So the Nikon Z7 is compatible with all of Nikon's flashes and accessories. So we tried it out with the SB910. Uh, one thing we did find was that although the SB910 mounted on uh, traditional Nikon DSLRs will project a red grid on your subject as the light levels drop to make focus just lock on really quickly, uh, it doesn't seem to work with this camera. It's not firing the AF grid. Instead, what we're getting is this green light, this green LED illuminating the subject. And uh, it's, not, it's not quite as effective as a grid for a focus system and also can be a little jarring to, to your it's, subject. It's distracting. Yeah. So I do want to talk about one thing and that's stop down focusing. Some mirrorless cameras will focus at the aperture that you're shooting. Other mirrorless cameras and DSLRs always focus wide open. This does something somewhere in between. You can see this f1.8 lens, as I'm stopping it down to 2.8, 4, you see the iris closing down, and now I'm at 5.6. But after 5.6, the camera no longer keeps stopping down. It just stays at 5.6. The benefit of wide open focusing is that you give the AF system as much light as you can, which helps it acquire focus very fast. Now the benefit of stop down focusing is focus tends to be more accurate. However, as light levels drop, focusing stop down can actually hurt the AF system because it's not getting much light. And that can actually lead to misfocus, inaccurate focus, or just hunting. This camera is a sort of compromise, but at least it doesn't stop down past f5.6, which would really hurt the AF system, especially in low light. This is the uh, new 24-70 f4. These spherical elements in here, and that's causing some really um, interesting patterns. Okay, Chris, I kind of really want to shoot with this camera. Can I take this off? So this one actually boosts up pretty quick and fires off the shot pretty quick. So it kind of adds to kind of a feeling of uh, immediacy. All right, so that's the end of day one. We got to enjoy a little bit of Seattle nightlife, but it's time to go to bed, wake up early tomorrow, and play some more with the Z7. So Barney, what I want to talk about is the lens mount, this new Z mount. It seems like a very simple thing, but it actually has the potential to be one of the most exciting developments on this new mm -hmm. camera, right? Yeah, it's a very big deal. The, uh, the Nikon F, this is the original Nikon F from 1959, um, introduced the F mount, which has been basically unchanged since then. Right. And this has a mount diameter of 44 millimeters. You compare that to 55 millimeters in the Z mount, straight away, it's a much, much, much bigger mount. Absolutely. So Nikon got a lot right with this in the late 50s, early 60s, but they also put themselves in a, in a bit of a mechanical corner. I've got to remember, I mean, companies like Canon, when they switched over to the EF mount, they went way larger. I know it ostracized a lot of the older users of the, of the you know, old mount, the bayonet mount, but it did give them potential to make new optical formulas. It did, and especially brighter lenses as well. Mm -hmm. 
The Z mount is much, much more future proof and also allows for very, very fast lenses. We know there's a 58 millimeter F0.95 knocked on the way. Now with that wide mount and the fact that we've got that 16 millimeter flange distance, it also opens up a lot of potential for adapting other lenses. It does. Right? This is probably looking like the most adaptable mount of any at this point. There's nothing that you can't adapt, assuming the availability of adapters onto the Nikon Z system. This is how it looks because it's so wide and so short. Very cool. So, on the Z7, I think one of the nicest things we've seen now, it is confirmed, inbuilt, in body stabilization. Yeah, and that's something we really saw that readers wanted. We started, um, we ran a poll when Nikon started teasing the whole campaign, and one of the top five answers was in body stabilization, so people will be really happy to see Fantastic that. Fantastic to see it. So it sounds like a really powerful system. Uh, you'll get five stops and five mm -hmm. axis stabilization with a native Z mount lens, and you'll still get three axis with the adapted I think the other cool thing that's really interesting, especially from a user's experience standpoint, it's locking the sensor up too if you want to do things like clean it mm -hmm. or transport it. Yeah, like put that. it on a gimbal. Right, absolutely. Yeah, so it sounds like a very well thought out system. Uh, I'm excited to try it a little bit for production. Yeah, we are too. Ultimate torture test for autofocus. Toddlers. The worst case scenario, we can put the bow on Chris and have him run around. One thing I'm finding as I'm doing the AF tests um, with our toddler is that uh, one of our favorite things about Nikon DSLRs, which is 3D tracking, um, is kind of just missing from this camera. With 3D tracking, you can easily just initiate focus on whatever subject you want by placing your AF point on it and then just half pressing the shutter button and the camera will do the rest of the work for you so you can be free to compose or your subject can move around. However, to do that on the Z7, you have to engage its subject tracking mode by pressing OK, then placing the center point over your subject, and then initiating AF. It's just not going to be as fast on this camera to switch between subjects, and that can affect real-world fast-paced shooting. However, the good thing is that if you're shooting using just the LCD, then you don't have to always hit OK to engage subject tracking. If you're in the auto area mode, you can just engage touch AF, and at that point, you can just tap on your subject and the camera will track it from that point on. Uh, and you can just re-tap on another subject and it'll track that subject, um, both in stills and in video. Okay, Jordan, so we finally get to sit down together, do a little yes. bit of a talk on video, which is actually one of the more exciting features on this well, camera. Well, and that's one of the big reasons people push for mirrorless. You can shoot great stills, and it's kind of an optimized format for video, much more than a DSLR. Sure. But and the D850 made big advances. In terms of image quality, and we could really see which way things were going. There were a lot more video-centric right. features in them, but it was tough to use a lot of them with that DSLR form factor. Now, the big benefit of mirrorless is we get the electronic viewfinder on And it's very high quality. It's very sharp. Even when you're shooting 4K video with yep. this guy. Now, there is one limitation to that. The punch-in focus is very sharp, it but it's choppy. extremely choppy yeah, once you jump sure. in, and you can't use it while you're rolling. So that's why I was really happy to see that we've got peaking. the peaking yeah. added to it. And in the D850, that only worked in 1080 recording. Yeah. Now we've got it in 4K, and it's a really nice system. Sure. Now, another big push for Nikon here, showing that video is something taken seriously. We now have 10-bit output, 4K, 422. Has to go to external recorder, but yeah. I mean, Sony doesn't do that yet. You'll need something like this, or there's an Atomos Ninja 5 that'll be a much better pair with a camera that size. But the big thing too is you've got to hook into something like this if you want to get the new N-Log. So this is their super flat profile. Yep. Now fortunately we had the Black Magic design one here so we were able to take a look at it. It is very flat. It's a more yes. traditional log profile than Nikon's flat profile which was Nice to color grade, sure. but really not a true log profile. This is a good step in a professional direction. Yeah. And, uh, you know, lookup tables, of course, this is super early, but we're probably going to see a lot of that come out. The other thing, too, with the 10-bit color space, you were even saying with the footage you played with yours early, yeah. pre-production stuff, yeah. uh, you were actually quite pleased with the color and the ability to push it a little bit. Yeah, right? I had two very different lighting setups. You were lit tungsten in this. Outside is very blue light, and I was able to get them where they need to be, and that's the big advantage of 10-bit color for me. Uh, when it comes to autofocus during video? Yeah, it actually does a really solid job mm -hmm. and compared to the Sony's I find it indicates where you're focusing quite a bit better. Right. The stabilizer as well, quite because effective. we've got such a big lens mount on this, it actually has some room to move. Here I did find it's more comparable to what we saw with the, like the Fuji X-H1, mm -hmm. uh, just a little more room to move around in that sensor. Did a great job when we were walking, still not quite what we were seeing on Micro Four Thirds, but again, this sure. is early. 
Now, when it comes to the lenses, though, then we've got some issues here from a video standpoint. So, first off, it is a focus by wire system. Yes. And it's not a linear system. No. So, you know, so you're, you're, it's going to be totally up to how fast you turn that ring, how far it's it just, It's not repeatable, which yeah. is really difficult for video work. And of course, I don't mind it because I'm a long time <laughs> Nikon user, but you, you're going to dislike the direction that the Nikon travels. And so far, it seems to be fixed in the rotation, well, just opposite from what a lot of videos It depends on use. what your background is. If you're a videographer, it focuses backwards. All right. video lenses focus the Canon direction but if you're a Nikon user moving into video then it's not going to bother you but let's remember it's electronic why not just give me the option to flip the direction in the menu like Olympus hopefully does. we'll see that in the future now from a handling standpoint uh, you've got some nice features of course headphone jack mic jack that has to be Necessary. given yeah and the screen actually in the back is really nice touchscreen interface is quiet and it's very usable yeah uh, the screen is high res but unfortunately we still just have that vertical articulation it, exactly so no yeah vlogging. this is not going to be the vlog camera of choice it's tough for you know us talking to camera something like that would be a little more difficult i do find with the gh5 i'm always going to the evf to confirm focus it's great to know you can check your focus whether on the lcd or the evf with this camera right because the z7 has such a higher res screen on the back exactly yeah all in all very nice thoughtful video features it's a definitely a good push in the exactly right between this and the d850 we can see nikon starting to take video more seriously all right, Carrie. Well, I think it's conclusion time. But before we get to that, I just want to say, Jordan and I had a really great time out here. It was f it was fantastic to finally get out here, see the whole team, and have this like early sneak peek at this brand new exciting camera. Absolutely, I agree. I mean, one of the things that Nikon is looking to be a differentiator with is how the camera really feels in your hand, right? I mean, what did you think about that? Great grip, interesting features. I think overall we can all agree the interface for the most part is really well done. You know, I mean, some of the function buttons were hard for me to press, but Viewfinder's excellent, yeah, you know, LCDs are excellent. The touchscreen interface is super polished, super absolutely, responsive. Absolutely, but you have to rely on it. You because do a little bit more, more so than if you're coming from a DA50 to this, there's gonna be a little bit more reliance on, on the touchscreen with the customizable menu, which is good. Yes, that's uh, a nice but, change. But that's definitely a little bit of an adjustment for existing users. So I, I guess the thing is this, I mean, we have to remember this is still pre-production. We're gonna do a full review on this camera. This is just a sneak peek and an early look, but some of the takeaways, image quality seems like it's pretty awesome. I'm pretty impressed with the lineup of lenses that they've started us with. It's clear that you know, Nikon is really jumping in with both feet for this, uh, for this system. Yes, but we've got to address the sort of main issue, which is, okay, this is not an SLR. You got a lot of people coming from SLRs. Mm -hmm. Is this camera going to be something that is seamless or is this going to require some adjustment? I mean, what do you think about that? So I think, I think there's, it's a little bit of a two-way street there. I think that it is going to win people over. I think that in a lot of ways, there is uh, some seamlessness with, you know, the grip, the menus are very familiar. Yes. And the image quality is up there with the DA50 in terms right. of image quality for this particular model. The autofocus system is a little different and I'm, you know, we, we can't make any, big bold claims about autofocus performance Not right yet. now. Although um, we've got Richard just uh, riding around his bike. On <laughs> He's, we're doing more tests, yeah. see how it actually performs. But one of the things that struck us is the uh, the interface for autofocus is much more like, it's it's using a Nikon DSLR and, and live view sort of a system, as opposed to really kind of trying to adapt the DSLR optical viewfinder system into a mirrorless. So while the system you know preliminarily performs very well, the, you know, the vernacular, the settings are a little bit different. So right. it's going to be a bit of an adjustment for people coming in. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, had a really good time. Otherwise, again, hopefully you guys enjoyed that sneak peek on the new, uh, I have to say it right, Z7. That's good. I still can't do it. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for joining us. Again, remember, leave comments below. Check out the Instagram feed. Go to deepreview.com because this is a big announcement. There's going to be a lot of information out there. Check the articles out. Check the sample galleries out. Tweet to us, Instagram, let us know what you think. Otherwise, we'll see you guys soon. And hopefully with a full review on this brand new camera.